I think there is a social disease, and uh, the prime minister is committed to making it worse, to making the disease really lethal. Uh, the disease is quite deep. It has to do with the way British society has been developing since Thatcher. Uh, and, uh, particular, and in fact, there are, you know, the riots, began, so called, were. Uh, they, they, they extended, but they were based in extremely deprived communities, uh, not in uh, fancy districts of London. And there's an obvious reason for that. When people are without hope, uh, live in desperate circumstances, uh, no, don't see any way to break out, the system just isn't allowing them anything, uh, they may uh, react uh, by. Uh, you know, uh, what's called crime, robbing things that they're not allowed to get. Uh, that shouldn't happen, but the way to deal with it is to deal with the pathology and not the symptoms. You know? And the pathology is being made worse by uh, Tory programs. And in fact, you know, the real robbery, I mean, in comparison with what happened in, uh, in the, what happened in the slums is essentially you know, marginal as compared with a major robbery, which you do see in the headlines of the papers. I mean, I, I was here last in uh, March, I guess it was, and practically every day, a big headline on the front page, you know, Barclays Bank executives uh, steal the huge this and that. Okay, that's major robbery. Uh, legal, you know, technically legal, but uh, it's institutionally created robbery, which uh, is, is extending the uh, uh, extreme inequality, uh, not because the big bankers are uh, performing social services or working hard or something like that, but just because of institutional diseases, the uh, same in the United States. So that's what really ought to be, that if Cameron is concerned with uh, social disease that's and robbery, that's what they should be focusing on, but of course that won't happen. Uh, it's the poor and the destitute who have to be uh, disciplined, made more poor and more destitute. Uh, it's, there's a much more serious crisis than what's called the financial crisis, and that's the unemployment crisis. Uh, that's the one that really has to be addressed. Uh, it's a little different in Europe and the United States. Uh, in the U.S., the jobs problem is, I, I think, overwhelmingly the uh, crucial one. Uh, focus is on the deficit, which is a minor problem. And that's the focus because that's what the financial institutions care about. And, uh, so, and they pretty much dominate policy formation. But the fact of the matter is that the in the U.S. the deficit is not a severe problem. I mean, there is maybe a long-term debt problem, but that's quite long. Uh, the deficit, in fact, could be overcome very straightforward. To the extent that it's a problem at all, and I think it's minor, it could be overcome by very simple means which are never discussed. Uh, so, for example, if, uh, if the United States had a health care system uh, like other industrial countries, which is not a utopian dream. In fact, most of the population has wanted it for a long time. But if that were implemented, there would be no deficit. In fact, there'd probably be a surplus. But that can't be discussed either, and it isn't discussed because the financial institutions don't want that. They want the highly dysfunctional uh, uh, U.S. healthcare system, which is essentially, which is privatized mostly and largely unregulated, and therefore uh, hopelessly uh, dysfunctional. So, if, so in the first place, it's not a major problem to begin with. Second place, it could be dealt with straightforwardly by m means that are not at all radical. In fact, you know, pretty conservative. But it can't be dis done, and it can't even be discussed uh, because of the extraordinary power of the business altogether, but financial institutions in particular. Because of the Eurozone, uh, Greece cannot adopt the methods that countries typically use to 
get out of a financial crisis, namely devaluing their currency and so on, has no control over its currency. And what the European community is imposing on Greece, in the view of many economists, and personally it seems plausible to me, uh, are designed to exacerbate the crisis. Now, that is, they're imposing austerity measures, in fact Europe's doing it altogether, and austerity measures in the midst of a financial crisis are very likely to increase the crisis because they cut growth and that's the best way out of a financial crisis. The public opinion has very little effect on policy in a deteriorating uh, democracy. Uh, so, so, so these are real problems that will remain, there are others, and uh, there's no uh, short term, uh, there's no force, that real functioning force that's uh, moving towards uh, addressing them seriously. There are popular forces, uh, in fact very striking ones right now, the, uh, the Occupy movement, which began in New York at Wall Street and now spread all over the country, are a, quite a remarkable development. Not a lot of problems. But Sorry to interrupt. Is there something that kind of taps into my second question? Is oh. that with, with the occupation of Wall Street, uh, and as, as you already mentioned, that this is, this is something that, that's a growing phenomenon in North America, um, A, is that something you think will continue to grow? Um, and B, given the, the, the relevance to any, any relevance to, 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 to what's happening in Europe, by way of example, yesterday, um, Westminster Bridge uh, was occupied um, uh, for, for the entire day against the plans of this of our government to, to privatise our NHS. Um, how, to what extent do you think that this this, this new direct action and, and activism, both in North America and and here in Europe, how much how much impact can it have? How much can it change things? Well, it's a little bit like asking for predictions about the financial crisis. Uh, the record of prediction is very poor, and for good reasons. Uh, a, a tremendous amount depends on just will and choice, and that's in the hands of you know, the participants and others, and nobody ever knows. Uh, the, uh, if you look at the uh, documents, of the, I think it's an extremely important movement. Whether it'll go anywhere, you know, how far, it's very hard to say. Well, it's almost a tautology that uh, a democracy can function uh, to the extent that the public has uh, inf information and analysis available that permit make, puts them in a position where they can make sensible decisions. In a functioning democracy, the public is supposed to make decisions. And if they're not in a position to do so, and if the structures of the society anyway don't even allow them to do so, as in the cases I mentioned, then you have a very limited democracy. Uh, I don't like to talk about the UK media, I don't read them regularly, but, so I get little pieces uh, here and there and look at them on the internet and so on, but uh, uh, the impression I get, I, uh, just to be make it personal, when I'm here in London, if I want to find out what's going on in the world, I have to pick up the New York Times on the internet. Uh, I can read half a dozen newspapers every day and I get a ton of information about gossip and you know, this society star and what this person's doing and so on. And you know, if you get into page 20, you may find a little uh, international news. But, uh, and uh, some of the, like on, on say business news, the Financial Times is the best in the world, I think. But you know, that's one domain. Uh, it's, uh, and, and there are extremely good correspondents. I mean, there are a few people I look for who are great, better than anyone, I, almost anyone I know anywhere in the world. But uh, it's, uh, it's pretty scattered. And the main thrust is, I don't think, is such that I can understand the public reaction. And uh, I think these are serious problems for a, a society that hopes to become democratic. It undermines functioning democracy in very obvious ways. Mr. Johnson, thank you so much. Yeah.